Jim and I uh, have, have written a, a book together and now work together and inevitably sort of end up saying the same thing. <laughs> and uh, I, I'd originally been, been sort of, uh, sort of uh, programmed in for a, a different, I, I think next week wasn't it originally. And then we decided, because I, I couldn't make it, we decided to put the, the two things on, on, the same, uh, on the same night. And we didn't uh, compare our slideshows this afternoon. So I've, uh, I realized that uh, our, our topics were actually quite, quite close. So I've, I've sort of changed things around and hopefully it won't be, be too repetitive uh, and, and boring for you. Um, I'm going to be talking about the physical practice of Hatha Yoga in, in sort of tradition. I'll, I'll move quite quickly through that bit because that's the bit that, that, uh, that Jim has, uh, has covered um, in, in the context of tapas, in the context of asceticism. Uh, and, then, and then in the second part, have a look at modernity, at uh, that where, where we wrapped up with, uh, with Jim's, uh, Jim's presentation, where you have this kind of... Uh, bizarre kind of feedback loop of this this yoga that has sort of expanded around the world and now is sort of you know being reflected also in traditional practitioners and then reflected back and so we'll have a look at those kinds of processes sort of you know bring the history up to uh, if not the present day at least the uh, the recent present um i'd i'd question the the term physical yoga to sort of indicate hatha yoga or um the, the, kind, the kind of yoga that, that we're working on at, at SOAS um, is, is an imperfect one in so far as what's physical and what's, what's not is, uh, is up, up for question. So when we think of physical yoga these days, we also think of, uh, we, we mainly think of, of postures. And in fact, that's what I'll be, I'll be talking about tonight, posture practice, um, asana. But of course, there, there are many other physical yoga practices within Hatha Yoga and, and outside of Hatha Yoga. And in fact, one might argue that no matter what one does, prior to those uh, most refined and rarefied and elevated states of non-cognitive samadhi, uh, are, are all physical in some respect. So from, from the, the gross kind of, uh, the, the cleanings, the, the shatkarma of, of, uh, of the Hatha Pradibhika, say, where you sort of wash the body out with water, uh, for instance, um, to those, those uh, you know, to, to, let's say, through asana, pranayam, meditation practice, samadhi practices, including listening to, sort of, you know, the subtle sounds, are all kind of embodied. So in a sense, that physical yoga is, is much broader than, than merely asana. We are sort of embodied human beings after all, at least, at least for the time being. Uh, and that, in some sense, in some senses is, is the problem. As, as Jim has said, uh, Jim mentioned, you know, today that there's an emphasis on, on yoga as a kind of, uh, to, 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 well, to build the body, and we'll, we'll see examples of that later, how that sort of comes into the vocabulary of yoga. But that actually, a lot of those practices were to diminish or uh, desiccate or, um, refine the body out of existence and all its physical elements. Of course, in the Sankhya system, you know, we start, let's say, from the bottom with, with the, the grossest elements, but materiality goes all the way up through the mind as well and into the sort of, you know, further reaches of, of, of the mind. So, you know, we're sort of, we're sort of caught in the material. So, uh, the, you know, the, the, phys the physical, the word physical is, uh, is always kind of uh, a, a, little bit, a little bit fluid, a little bit uh, porous. Uh, th this is where the, <laughs> the, the crossovers start. So uh, this, this is the, uh, the seal that, uh, that uh, Jim was talking about. I'm going to be saying, I'm going to try and not say, as Jim said, <laughs> um, from the Indus Valley, you know, that, that we can't really take as evidence of uh, a kind of uh, uh, yoga practice or as, a, as a, uh, a, uh, an asana of yoga because evidence for a context in which such a seated practice, yoga practice, would, would, uh, would happen is, is not there. So, um, uh, you know, some people have argued that this is in fact a Eurasian tree god. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with yoga, it doesn't have anything to do with Shiva. So to, to make that leap, I think, is, is a, um, it's a, it's a difficult leap anyway. 
you were hearing earlier about uh, the Buddha, Buddha and the, the Shramana tradition around about 500 BCE, this kind of new movement uh, in reaction against the, the Vedic in some ways, um, that, that also uh, that used a lot of these um, ascetic difficult uh, practices which the Buddha himself engaged in. Now, uh, asana, as well as, as well, as well as there being a link, a very strong link to tapas in, uh, in, in asana, there's also a very strong link to practices of meditation that aren't necessarily to do with mortification of the body, that's to say tapas. Um, so, for instance, here we, we have uh, the, a seated Buddha here from, from somewhere in the early common era, uh, that should say Gandhara, so it's, it's from Gandhara, so it's over, um, over the other side, sort of near, I think, modern-day Peshawar in, in uh, sort of north-west uh, Pakistan, near, near the border of, of Afghanistan. Um, and this is the earliest, this is the earliest, within Buddhist texts we have the earliest evidence for something called, for a practice called yoga, such, such that we might think of it today. That's to say a seated meditation practice. It's called dhyana yoga, the yoga of meditation. And so uh, as, as well as these very physical practices that, that we've been seeing, from the very earliest times this, uh, the yoga itself and the postures of yoga are associated with, with meditative practice primarily, one might argue. Uh, I was looking at this again the other, uh, t today, that, uh, and this, this strange sort of left foot. This Buddha has two left feet. Uh, <laughs> so not, not, a, not a dancing Buddha. Un unlike Shiva, probably not, uh, this, this Buddha does not dance. Um, and I, I, won't, I won't dwell on, dwell on this for long, but also we have uh, records of the, the earliest postures, some, you know, some very early postures in, in Jain, uh, texts from the, the third or fourth century, seven, seven postures which are very much within the, the context of, uh, of, of tapas. But you also have, uh, as, as you see here, very, very, you know, similar to the Buddha, Buddhist image, a very sort of you know, relaxed kind of seated, uh, seated med meditation posture within, within Jainism. And um, as Jim said, <laughs> here's, a, here's, a, here's a later picture of, uh, of um, Alexander meeting those, those gymnosophists, uh, you know, take, taking these, uh, these, difficult, uh, these difficult postures. So th this is going to get a bit silly because um, I'm showing, uh, the, you know, the, the development of, of complex postures. You've heard all this before, the first, uh, the first complex uh, postures in... in uh, um, emerging that, that are not seated, which would be um, Mayurasana and, and Kukutasana. Here is from Sri Shailam um, and here from the, um, the Jog Pradivika. So you've heard all this. <laughs> and then, you know, we come to the Hatha Pradivika. So this kind of uh, um, synthesis of many different texts from Hatha traditions that have come before that, that have sort of um, been anthologized in some way or re-edited into this, uh, uh, this expression of Hatha Yoga called, called the Hatha Pradibhika, which is, is very well known today and there's, there's many translations, um, with I think 15 postures, uh, seven seated and eight non-seated. So it's almost as if the, the balance has tipped, we're into a different kind of era where previously posture was primarily, predominantly associated with sitting down and not moving. Uh, now it's associated with something slightly different. If you, know, if, if you look at uh, these poses, for instance, Mayurasana, you're unlikely to be able to hold Mayurasana for several hours at a time, say. It's hard if anybody you know, has, ever, has ever tried that. Well, you know, sort of 10 breaths is, uh, is good going. Um, so we're, into, we're moving into something different. Asana is being repurposed. It, it's being uh, reimagined as something else. Uh, and that is, that's within the context of, of Hatha Yoga. It's, it's a way to um, 
uh, get lightness of the body and strength of the body. So there's a kind of uh, physicalized component. Uh, it prepares one for what's coming next in, in this very physical sadhana, which is pranayam practice, uh, which is a difficult, uh, a difficult tapas. And so we're, we're sort of, um, I'm, I'm going to fly through this bit so I can get to the second bit. But in, in a nutshell, what we get after the Hatha Pradipika is this sort of expansion of asanas, of the number of asanas, and in certain texts of, of, their, of their importance. So in these early precursors, in, in some of these texts that, that are actually cut and pasted into the Hatha Pradipika, you know, you, you'll, find, you'll find one posture or two postures, and they're likely to be simple seated postures, like Padmasana, the lotus pose, or uh, Siddhasana, uh, you know, varieties of cross-legged or, or sort of kneeling poses, possibly squatting poses. Then the Hatha, Pradib Hatha Pradibhika, and then the, uh, into the 17th century, you start to get, you know, more and more. Uh, and this is, this is where... Uh, our other colleague who's not here tonight, Jason Birch, has, has done very good work on, on tracing, uh, tracing this development. And in fact, we're working uh, at the moment on a text called the Yoga Chintamani, one manuscript of which has uh, 110 postures, which is quite, quite incredible, quite, um, quite unique um, in, in some ways. And then another text, the Hatha Ratnavali, uh, 84 postures, and, and so on, into the 18th century. We've seen examples of the, oh, this um, Rudra, Rudrayamala Tantra has 100 postures. This is interesting for being a tantric text, I, I think. I think I'm right in saying that uh, it, it's, it's unusual for have, to have so much emphasis placed on asanas within, within a tantric text. They don't usually emphasize that. Uh, and then the Jog Pradivika, we, we've seen those pictures of uh, the, the Mayurasana earlier on the, on the left there. That was from, from an illustrated manuscript of that. And then finally, and I'll talk about this in, in uh, a bit more detail now, the Hatha Bhyasa Pariti, which is another one of the texts that we're working on at SOAS. So uh, the Dattatreya that, that Jim's already, um, already done a lot of work on, the Viveka Martanda. Uh, Yoga Chintamani and this one, the Hatha Bhyasa Paditya, are one, two, three, four of, of the ten that we're working on. Uh, this is a picture, this is from this, uh, the Yoga Chintamani. It's got three different lists of, uh, of postures and includes this kind of table, this alphabetical table where, you know, that, has, that arranges the, uh, uh, the postures according to alphabetical order. So it's quite unique and, and quite sort of... Uh, uh, a scholar's job, if you like, you know, so somebody's trying to sort of make sense of all this and, and organize things. So we're at quite, quite an interesting moment in history. This one is the Hatabhyasa Padati. So this is the first page on, on the left here, uh, quite uh, damaged in, in places. And this is an example from later on in the text. So it's not, it's not just a text about asanas. Uh, but it, uh, it has other material, in particular, a long description of um, Vajroli Mudra, which uh, I, think, I think you mentioned, Jim. Uh, but we have lots of descriptions of uh, asanas. We have 112 of them. And they're arranged like this often on the, on the page with blanks. So that's unusual. Usually, because paper is expensive, you want to fill up the page. But um, there's, there's gaps left between the descriptions of the postures. And that, we presume, was, uh, was to later include uh, images, which never, got, which never got done. This, uh, this text has, um, was copied, or a, uh, a third sort of original text was copied uh, almost word for word into a text called, a 19th century text called the Sri Tattvaniti, which some, some of you might know, um, that was composed in Mysore in the middle of the 19th century, uh, and that was images of which were published uh, in uh, a book by Norman Showman called The Yoga Tradition of the Mysore Palace, because that's, that's where it was, uh, it was composed, that's where this text was and, uh, and is, or at least you know, some of them, there's, there's a few copies. And uh, so the, the, uh, the Sanskrit, the, the script is different, but the, the Sanskrit's the same, the verses are the same, there's more postures in the Sri Tattvaniti, there's additional postures, but the difference is that they've been, they've been rearranged, they've been sort of jumbled up 
and arranged according to the redactor's notion of, of, uh, of, of how, how things should be. So he says that there should be 80 principal postures. There are 80 principal postures. So he pulls them out of this original text, the, the Hatabya Sapadati, and puts them together, 80. Then the rest, he, he sort of calls additional asanas and sticks them at the end. Now the problem with doing this is that you lose the point of the Hatabhyasa Padati and you lose, the, you lose what makes it uh, actually an original and quite unique text uh, as far as we know and that's that it describes what appear to be sequences of postures. In most texts uh, that we know of the, there are no sequences, there's no real sense that you can uh, sort of move from one, uh, one posture to the next. Um, sometimes, as, as is the case in, in, uh, in the Hatabhyasa Padati, uh, postures are named and then, you know, you, in, in another posture it says, having assumed that pose, then do this. There's, there's that sort of thing goes on. But I think in, in this earlier text, so we're comparing these two texts, this, this earlier text, it's quite clear that there are actually uh, distinct sequences. And uh, we have, in collaboration with uh, Ruth and Aggie, who are, who are sitting here, hello, <laughs> uh, just uh, made a, a film ab about this sequence. Um, ab about this text uh, that we'll be that we'll be putting out well once we've got it uh, we've got it finalised, um, and this is a very interesting text. It, it sort of takes us into uh, the the modern period, if you like. It, it's a good it's a good sort of transition, and I think it is a, a linking moment in uh, in a sort of history that that many of you will will be familiar with, because uh, this text, the Sri Tattvaniti. Was, uh, was known to uh, a yoga teacher called uh, T. Krishnamacharya, um, who trained Iyengar and um, Patabi Joyce, his son TKV Desikachar, uh, and, um, and, and others. And so, you know, it has, has a, some claim to be called, you know, the father of modern postural yoga. He's had a huge influence. If it wasn't for Krishnamacharya, well, you know, we probably wouldn't have yoga mats. Um, <laughs> we wouldn't. We, we might not be sitting here. Uh, so the Sri Tattva Niti, we, we know that it was important to Krishnamacharya. Why? Because uh, this is this is a, a text, and maybe uh, Colin will have more to say about this actually later. Um, th that um, there's a copy of that, obviously, right? Do you, do you? I don't know if you agree. It looks looks to me like a like a, it's been traced. Uh, and this was a, was a manuscript that belonged to Krishnamacharya. He said that he got it from his guru's daughter in Tibet and brought it back with him. Um, I, I think it's probably more likely that either he or his daughter uh, traced this from, from the, the palace Sri Tatvanidhi. So, so close are, are, the, are the copies. It's, it would be it's un unimaginable that somehow by accident this, this happened. So that we, we know that he was taking a close interest in this text. Uh, and it's acknowledged in, in one of his books, in his first book, Yoga Makaranda. And then in his second book, something quite strange happens. In his list of sources, um, he lists, along with the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, that's to say uh, the Yoga Sutras, um, the, Hat, uh, the Hatha Pradipika, um, the Raja Yoga Ratnakara, Yoga Upanishads, he lists, he lists a text uh, called the Yoga Kuranti. Um, which, of course, uh, uh, has, has led, well, which is said to be the source text of the modern day practice of Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, which, which has been missing and uh, a, a mystery for, for a long time. Um, we are surmising that actually, I, well, I, I, I suppose I'm, I'm surmising that um, Krishnamacharya, between those two books, actually uh, discovered that the Sri Tattva Niti was in fact a reworking of an earlier text that was associated, that was, is said to be written by um, one Kapala Kuruntaka, is the, is the author of the Hatabhyasa Padati. Uh, and that to him, that text, whatever it is, is, 
is known as the Yoga Kuranti, and that's how that, that sort of name, that name got into uh, sort of, you know, modern yoga lore. Uh, it's not the same text, it's not, it's not, um, I, I, it's really not a kind of an easy route from, from that text to, to sort of modern uh, Ashtanga yoga. But it's, it's really quite interesting to see, you know, to consider that that, that might have been an, an influence on Krishnamacharya. Now the, uh, the final, the final, uh, final item in the list is, so he's saying I've learned from, from these texts, and I've also learned from the instructions of my guru and from my own experience or my own inspiration. Uh, and I think that's, that's an important, also an important element to bear in mind that when thinking about sort of uh, how, um, how new traditions are created, how old traditions are transmitted, is that Krishnamacharya is in some respects acknowledging his own part in, in sort of, you know, creating a, a new system as well as, as well as drawing on the old. The, just one more thing to mention about, about the Hatabhyasa Padati is that uh, it includes a number of very strange postures that are performed on ropes. Um, which is not uh, unusual these days, right? I mean, if you go to an Iyengi yoga studio, you'll see ropes hanging from the walls. And in fact, here's a... Uh, Here's a short, short clip of um, Iyengar himself doing, doing various things on ropes um, with Gita Iyengar here and I think Prashant over there, uh, so daughter and son. However, and they call this, uh, Gita Iyengar calls this in her book, Yoga, A Gem for Women, she calls this practice Yoga Kurunti, I think. I think that's how she spells it. Uh, saying that Kurunti means puppet. But possibly, who knows, you know, it's a little speculation, but possibly that is also a reference back to this text, the Yoga Kurunta, uh, which includes these ropes, and that's, that's how Krishnamacharya explained it, possibly to, uh, to Iyengar himself. I'm inclined to, um, to wrap up Fairly, fairly quickly. It's getting, it's getting late, um, but I'll, I'll just uh, maybe give a give a whistle stop, sort of three or four minute tour of, of of what sort of what comes next after that sort of you know late nineteenth century um, sort of uh, well the, af after the Sri Tattva Nidhi say that's, that that's happening in in India, but at the same time internationally you start to have yoga moving out of India and starting to be known and taught as something that can be practiced rather than something that just can be looked at. It's something that you can actually do. And these, these are two of the people sort of, you know, teaching a kind of practical yoga for the first time. Swami Vivekananda, who, uh, who came here uh, and also then traveled to um, Chicago in 1893 uh, and, and taught probably the, the first practical yoga classes and had an incredible influence through his books, in particular, Raja Yoga. And this, this uh, history might be familiar to many of you. And of course, uh, Madame Blavatsky, she's looking a bit blurred and slightly, slightly scary as ever. <laughs> uh, uh, who founded the, the Theosophical Society, which was you know, single-handedly almost getting the word out about Indian religion and in particular yoga, and also churning out many, many editions of, uh, of yoga texts uh, and many translations of the Yoga Sutras and, and so on. But then you had these sort of um, ambassadors like Vivekananda uh, and Blavatsky who were not teaching postures, crucially. They didn't much like Hatha Yoga or Hatha Yogins. And you can sort of guess why, really. Um, Jim was talking uh, about the sort of the, the sinister yogis, those, you know, they'll sort of uh, kidnap your kids. Uh, the, the, kind of, uh, the kind of renunciants who weren't particularly well regarded in, uh, in well, what, let's say, um, educated modern Indian society. And another reason why you might want to stay away from, uh, from Hatha Yoga is because of its association with magic and Western occultism. So Hatha Yoga was being taught by the likes of um, Max Vilke here, uh, but it was being taught as magic. 
and yoga more generally and tantra were being taught as sort of black magic by the likes of uh, Alistair Crowley here who authored uh, you know uh, a, a book on yoga a commentary on the yoga sutras in fact but who was mostly interested in magic and you also had the association of yoga with contortionism and this is probably the earliest uh, yoga demonstration on British soil in, from about 1893 as well, I think, that was at the Westminster Aquarium, a very uh, um, accomplished yogi called Baba Lakshman Das. But nobody's doing it, nobody's doing it. So we have to wait, we have to wait. I'm, I'm squeezing, I'm, I'm sort of, this is a very, very potted history here. Uh, And then, <laughs> in my very simple story, what happens is that uh, the postures of yoga, within, within that movement of modern yoga, that new interest, that global interest in modern yoga, uh, the asanas of yoga become associated with physical culture, with keep fit. Obviously, there's a continuum with what we saw from in, within hatha yoga, that concern for the lightness of the body, the firmness of the body, uh, a sort of health, within from from hatha yoga but here it starts to have this strange new life where it gets uh gets bound up with this uh global physical culture movement and bodybuilding and gymnastics and so on uh and i won't say uh, i won't say much more about that i've written about it in uh in my book yoga body um And this is the time also when Surya Namaskar starts to be sort of introduced into yoga. Previously, Surya Namaskar was not a part of yoga. We have, uh, I think, only one reference to it in the Jyotsna commentary, the 19th century commentary to the Hatha Pradipika, where one is instructed not to practice many uh, Surya Namaskars, uh, nor weightlifting, because they, they damage the body. Um, which may be, I, I keep thinking that that might be an indication that actually people were practicing Surya Namaskar as part of yoga already, and hence the, the need for the, the, uh, the warning. But um, it's when, when we get to this figure here on the right, the Raja Vaund, himself a, a bodybuilder in the tradition, tradition of Sandow, that we start to see this re-emergence of these, of these practices of Surya Namaskar coming back in and eventually, not in his hands, but becoming very popular as a practice in itself and then getting uh, kind of mixed into yoga as, as we know it today. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's see, you can, you can read all about this in, um, in, in the book if you, if, you want to, if you want to know more. Just to say that um, there, there are certain vectors, let's say, which we can see through tradition, we can see them emerging perhaps. But then we have this, this sort of other stream that comes in. India sort of, you know, opening up to the rest of the world. An enormous kind of uh, um, flow of information, flow of sort of technologies of the body traveling around the globe. And um, we, we get this new sort of synthesis, which um, one, one scholar, Elizabeth Michaelis, has called modern postural yoga. So um, I, th I think it's, it's interesting to note sort of that, that we are sort of seeing a continuity, but we get to this point where things start to change so rapidly, and we see that now, that yoga is sort of expanding outwards. We also we see the association with fitness in these early yoga pioneers. Uh, we see the, the sort of fascination with science and with scientific instruments and the measuring of the body uh, in order to determine how effective yoga is. So quite a, you know, so quite an empirical sort of thing. Uh, and I, th I think that's sort of encapsulated by this, this image here, which is, has been my favorite, favorite picture for a, for a while now, of Swami Shivananda, one of the early gurus of, of uh, a, a kind of modern yoga, sitting here with his stethoscope on the heart of a yogi, such that the yogi's own internal vision, his yogi pratyaksha, is no longer sufficient, but modern science must intervene in order to to see inside, inside the yogi. Um, there's lots more to say, but um, I, th I think I should wrap it up so we, we can all, uh, uh, we, we can have some questions and uh, wh what do you think, is that a good idea? Yeah, yeah. okay, thanks very much. So. <laughs> that was a bit,
chaotic and, uh, and incoherent, but I hope, uh, <laughs> hope you got something from it. Uh, is that first in the Viveka Martanda? Uh, so it's sort of, it's, a, it's an old number. Uh, well, eight, 84, it's 84 lakh, isn't it? So 8,400,000, 8, I think. So quite a lot. <laughs> but it's funny, you, you get that sort of, that number, which I presume at the time must be sort of rhetorical. Um, but then in, in that same text, you, you, only get, you only get one posture or two postures. Loads and loads, yeah, absolutely, as yeah. As many as there are living beings. As many as there are living beings, yeah. So it's like the sort of 10,000 things in, uh, in, in Chinese sources, I think. Yeah. So. Hmm. Yeah. Not that I can think of. I mean, they, they do, they do they're, they're not purely physical. They, you know, in, within Hatha Yoga, they, they move uh, certain, you know, certain energies in certain ways. They stimulate the digestive fire. They, uh, they're part and parcel of a practice which refines a physical substance, often in, in one sort of frame, that's to say semen, into something that's not quite physical, that's more of a, you know, moving towards the spiritual principle. But that sacred geometry thing, no, I don't think so. There's, there's, you do get that sort of thing in, um, in some tantric texts, like there's an early tantra called the Nishvasa Tattva Sanghita from the, the fifth century, which describes a sort of, you know, the, the practitioner putting himself into, into certain sort of geometrical uh, patterns. But it's, I, I don't think, it's not within the, the yoga section, is it? That, uh, it? And it's sort of, you know, it's sort of the, the way the body is shaped, like the gaps between the teeth are, are significant. And the letters of the alphabet. It's the letters of the alphabet, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, alignment is certainly is certainly important um, in in one sense, and you know, in the sitting postures. You, there, there in fact, um, I was going to read out a passage from uh, um, the commentary attributed to Shankara on, on Patanjali's on, on Patanjali, um, which has you know, which is, is very precise about about how you should be how you should be sitting in, in your Padmasana. It's not just right leg on left and, and you know left thigh and so on. Um, th there, there is, there's an awful lot of that, um, that kind of instruction. But the kind of alignment that we get in, uh, let's say, modern, uh, in Iyengar system, I think probably you'd look for your sources elsewhere from, from a kind of uh, notions that aren't necessarily from within older yoga traditions, but come from, well, the idea that, that by putting, putting your body in, into a certain shape, you can open up, open up sort of flows of energy or you, you can... Uh, you know, access a kind of, uh, you can access prana in, in a different way by, and you, you see similar kinds of thing in, um, in chiropractic theory, osteopathy and things like that. Um, so my, my sense, my guess would be that that idea of alignment and perfect alignment within posture is, is quite, a, quite a modern thing that's informed by, by these, other, uh, these other theories of the body, I, I think. The exact exact postures? No, not that I know of. No, I, I can't. I can't think of it. Don't think so. <laughs> Don't think so. Maybe w one or two more, if there are any. Yeah. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Has, has it made it better? Like. I, Oh, sorry, the, the question is, so the, in the, the emphasis on, on scientific instruments, this is Swami Kuvalayananda who sort of started all that, along with the, this, this person at the top, Yogendra, they started all this sort of experimentation with machines and measurements that, that we see so much of today, especially with, uh, with neuroscience and all of that. Um, 
In, in, one, in one way, I mean, it's giving us an awful lot of material about what happens in, uh, when, when you do yoga. You know, you can, you can see an awful lot more. But it seems to me that by shining such a bright light on the, the, on, on the body, uh, and now increasingly on, on the brain, the, the other ways of looking at yoga and at the body are harder to see, as, as it is, you know, when you, when you shine a spotlight on something, it's hard to see around it. So what has happened is that those, those older models of, of the yogic body with the, uh, let's say, the, the chakras um, or the, the, you know, the sort of um, the subtle elements of the body or the kundalini have been either sort of forgotten about or they've been reinterpreted um, according to the empirical medical standards of the day. So the chakras become plexuses, um, the nadis become, you know, veins or they become meridians or, or something. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. You, in, in some ways, we, we've gone a, a very long way down um, that, that scientific line and it's yielded some very useful results in terms of um, medical applications and of yoga and so on. But then it's very hard to it's very hard to assimilate the traditional vision of the yogic body in, into that. So it's kind of, it's kind of a, a tension that I think is still there. Yeah. Okay, last, last one then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think maybe, maybe three years ago now, at the Welcome Collection, there was um, an exhibition on um, Tibetan tantric Buddhism. Mm, mm. Um, and they showed a video there of a certain sequence of postures, yeah. that, um, where the guy was like flying up in the air, crossing his legs, so mm. do you think that's where the idea of sequential yoga might come from, or even the idea of the flying thing with the Siddhi? Um, so that, those practices are called truldkur, okay. and um, they are, they are in, indeed sequences, and you find sequences in, in Tibetan sources, um, uh, I think, in, in a way that you don't generally in, in Indian sources. Uh, the, there, are some, there are some interesting parallels. We, we, we've been talking about this. In fact, the, uh, the curator of that exhibition, uh, Ian Baker, is... Um, is also involved in, in the, the, v, the V&A show that, uh, that Jim was talking about. So we, a couple of days ago, we, we, were sort of, we were discussing this. And I think there is, there is sort of more work to be done um, on, on those, those sorts of crossovers. And there are similar ideas that go through, especially through models of, of the yogic body and how to manipulate particular energies, how, how to um, sort of make, make that energy ascend, generally. Um, but the, whether that is an influence on sort of, uh, on sequences, let's say in the Hatabhyasa Padati or in sort of, you know, modern sequences, I don't think so, but I'm, I'm definitely prepared to be surprised, you know. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, and it's an amazing sort of separate uh, tradition that, that's, uh, you know, that doesn't, doesn't sort of grow in the same way as, as, the, as the Indian tradition. So. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.